There are not many people that can uh, ignore or turn in their head and looking at a train going by, even if it's for a moment. They're big, they're heavy, they're moving fast, they're carrying lots of freight and momentum. Just something about railroading in general is romantic. They conduct on the cab, waving at people as they go by. They're looking for the wave, people standing by the railroad track for a train to go by. It's exciting. It triggers something, seeing a train triggers something. The RFP has always had a, a unique relationship with the state of Virginia and with the citizens of Virginia. The railroad, Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac, is part and parcel of Virginia history. And it's fun history. The RFNP was the sixth railroad to be chartered in the Commonwealth, receiving exclusive rights from the General Assembly to build a route from Richmond through Fredericksburg to an access point on the Potomac River and the steamboats operating there. John Lancaster was elected president of the new company and in December 1834 signed a contract for the construction of the first 27 miles of track. With locomotives newly acquired from England, the railroad was set to launch operations from its Richmond headquarters. The RF&P Railroad started off, if you can imagine standing on the steps of the, uh, the Library of Virginia, that was basically where the train station was in the middle of Broad Street. The tracks proceeded west from uh, 8th and Broad and they crossed the city streets, which caused a great deal of angst. It was like mixing oil and water. And they, the big start in what was critically important was that they could go about 10 miles an hour when things were good. But things weren't always good. Accidents were all but inevitable. Tensions with the city came to a head years later when resident Thomas Clement was crushed by a streetcar while trying to subdue a runaway horse that had been startled by a locomotive. The Richmond City Council reacted by requiring the railroad to move its operations outside the city center. RF&P relocated west to Elba Station near the current intersection of Broad and Belvedere Streets. It wasn't a great master plan for uh, national transportation. It was a very localized endeavor. Most railroads in Virginia in the early years were feeders to water transportation. And RF&P was nothing but a shortcut to water uh, on the Potomac River. And uh, RF&P resisted pleas from the Virginia Board of Public Works to extend its line to Alexandria. By early 1837, the railroad had completed 61 miles of track connecting Richmond to Fredericksburg. The RF&P's next step was to link freight and passengers to the Potomac River and the steamboats plying its waters. Passengers to Washington purchased a package deal, 75 miles by train to Aquia Creek, a tributary of the Potomac, then 55 miles by boat to the nation's capital. RF&P went right along the fall line and uh, it had a nice, fairly level route. But most people don't know that when we think of Potomac, we think about looking across the Long Bridge and seeing the uh, Jefferson Memorial and the Washington Monument. Back then, the Potomac meant the Potomac River where Aquia Creek emptied into it, because that's up until after the Civil War, that's as far as the RF&P Railroad went. Railroads would play a key role in the Civil War enabling troops and supplies to move faster and further than ever before. When the Civil War broke out, one of the greatest amphibious invasions, if you can imagine this, the Union forces loaded up entire trains with locomotives and cars and men and brought them down the Potomac River and landed at Aquire Creek at the end of the r and Railroad. The idea was that reinforcements and supplies could be transported, and a great deal of it was on the rf and Railroad. The opposing forces would come out and they would tear the railroad up, uh, they would rebuild it. The fighting along the rf and led to impressive feats of engineering by both sides. One in particular, following the Confederate destruction of a bridge over Potomac Creek, stands out. At more than 400 feet long and just over 80 feet high, it was rebuilt from standing timber in just 40 hours. 
it was the weirdest looking thing you've ever seen. In fact, Abraham Lincoln came down and uh, he met with Herman Hopp, who was the head of the uh, U.S. railroads, the, the government railroads at the time. And Abraham Lincoln looked, he had a good old wood splitter that Abraham Lincoln was anyway, looked up at that bridge and he said, that man Hop has built a bridge made of nothing but bean poles and corn stalks. And that bridge became known to RF&P employees as the Beanpole Bridge. But to prove to Lincoln that the, the bridge would hold up, they actually rolled a locomotive uh, and a tender and a car out onto the bridge just to prove to Lincoln that the bridge would hold up. The RF&P was swept up in a case of Civil War intrigue when one of its employees, Superintendent of Transportation Samuel Ruth, a Pennsylvania native, was accused by Confederate officials of spying for the Union. There were divided loyalties. I mean, you know, this was, this was the thing about the Civil War. You're talking about brother versus brother and father versus son, and the railroads being as vital as they were to the, the Civil War. If you had a spy and he worked for the railroad, you could change the course of history. And I guess the most damning thing about Ruth was that he later after the war applied for a federal pension for his services to the Union, so that's pretty good evidence. The Civil War laid waste to the infrastructure and economy of Virginia and the South as a whole. Working railroads would be essential to the region's recovery. Recognizing this need, the Commonwealth provided significant support to the RF&P to help the railroad get back on its feet. Business activities between the North and South were not long to resume following the war, especially in the railroad industry. The RF&P again came under pressure to extend its rails beyond Aquia Creek and abandon its connection to the steamboat trade on the Potomac. After the Civil War, they continued the steamboat service and the Pennsylvania Railroad was flexing its muscles north of Washington and it built from Baltimore down to Washington and then proceeded to, through a, a couple of subsidiaries, the Alexandria and Fredericksburg Railroad being one, to build south. They ultimately built as far south as Quantico and the RF&P then built as far north as Quantico and they made a connection there about 1872. Passenger train cars and sleeping cars started running from Baltimore, which was a significant change. That was when freight started, really. The steamboat service was eliminated. The RF&P saw an opportunity to improve local passenger travel as well and introduced accommodation trains, an early version of the modern commuter train. One operated in Northern Virginia, while a second train ran between Richmond and Ashland, offering several stops in Henrico. The railroads did so much to tie communities together, and it certainly was no different here in Henrico. John Cousins built Forest Lodge based on the fact that there was an RF&P stop at Glen Allen Station. So he really hoped that people traveling from New York to, say, Florida would take a pit stop here in Glen Allen and stay at his resort. So a lot of things revolved around this, this passenger travel in and out of Henrico County. It was a real hub. I mean, it, it put Glen Allen on the map, certainly. It's where you got all your information. It was not just a center for transportation, but it was a center for communication. And so that's where you got your news. The RF&P found itself in the news nationwide when a northbound mail train fell prey to a well-organized pair of thieves in 1894. The daring nighttime heist was the first train robbery in Virginia. Armed with pistols and dynamite, the bandits made off with what was initially estimated at around $180,000 and managed to scuttle the locomotive before escaping just north of Aquia Creek. A rash of finger pointing ensued, rewards were offered, and the culprits were quickly apprehended. Meanwhile, back in Richmond, the business of moving people and things carried on. One thing about uh, the railroads, although Richmond had a number of railroads that came together, the railroads didn't connect. They didn't connect. You wanted to make money and you had a strong back or a, a wagon and a team of horses, you could make a fortune in Richmond. You had to take your goods and your person and go from one station to the other. 
It was a long time before we had what we call Union Stations. People often ask, why, why is it called Union Station? Union Stations were stations where more than one railroad came together. Main Street Station was a Union Station in Richmond because the Seaboard Airline and the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad came there. Broad Street Station was Broad Street Union Station because you had the Atlantic Coast Line and the rf &P Railroads that came in there. Designed by renowned architect John Russell Pope, whose later work included the Jefferson Memorial, Broad Street Station was described as a cathedral of transportation. It took two years and more than three million dollars to build, and it opened in early 1919. All the famous people until the aviation age traveled up, up and down the RFP. and You know, uh, FDR, Winston Churchill, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Rockefeller, uh, just everybody who was anybody went up and down the RFP. and Lots of people went off the wall uh, from Broad Street Station and in Richmond and of course other stations as well. The RF&P played a vital role in the Second World War, a time that would prove to be the railroad's busiest. Activity crested in 1943 when the RF&P averaged more than 100 trains a day. In June 1944, the RF&P received the National Security Award from the U.S. Office of Civilian Defense, honoring the railroad's superior performance and contribution to the nation's war effort. The RF&P was the first railroad chosen for the award. The peak of the RF&P unquestionably had to be World War II, where there's so many army bases and military bases in Virginia. Trains were running one after the other, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We were the conduit between major railroads to the north, the Pennsylvania and the V&O, and major railroads to the south, the Atlantic Coast Line and the seaboard. All of that freight came through, and it was huge. Practically everything, all the freight and all the military and all the troop trains and practically all the passenger was on the railroads in World War II. You got to remember it was all done at that time with steam locomotives, freight and passenger. Diesels didn't really evolve until about 1950. When you had a steam engine, you had to have an engineer and a fireman on each steam engine. Diesel locomotives, you can string six, seven, eight of them together if you need them. The engineer sits in the cab of the diesel locomotive, he moves that throttle, they all respond at the same time. You're just, you're just adding power on. You couldn't do this with a steam engine. They were beautiful things. People loved them, but you couldn't compete. The RF&P was so proud of the first diesel passenger locomotives that they had. Governor Tuck showed up at Broad Street Station this was a big thing. Modernization left no room for nostalgia. RF&P's steam engines were literally pushed aside in favor of the new, more efficient locomotives. They basically took all of the steam locomotives up to the roundhouse up there near Aka Yard. They shoved them all into the weeds and they built a new facility, the big uh, shop at Bryan, they call it Bryan Park Engine Terminal specifically for diesels. The steam locomotives, they had to have a big roundhouse and back shops so that all these machinists and blacksmiths could work on the locomotives. Whereas the RFP built that uh, fabricated metal building out there at Bryan Park Terminal, the diesel would run through there and the mechanics and whoever could get down around it and shoot oil into it and uh, grease it, put sand and, and water in, and fuel it in a, in a matter of just a few minutes and have it ready to go back uh, up to Potomac Yard or passenger engines up to Union Station. To boost revenue in the post-war years, the RF&P began marketing a variety of special trains to attract local customers. Passengers could get a package deal to see a Broadway show or take in a Redskins or Senators game in Washington. One train in particular had a special appeal for kids. Miller Road's department store here in Richmond was famous because during the, uh, the weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas, on Saturdays, they would have as many as four special trains, 20 cars in length, 2,000 children on each of them, and the train would leave Broad Street Station. It would go to the North Pole, which strangely enough looked a great deal like Ashland, 
where Santa Claus and the Miller and Road Snow Queen would hop aboard and they would walk through the train and Santa would see each and every child. Keeping those children safe, as well as other passengers and employees, was always a top priority. RF&P championed the safety first message and displayed the slogan prominently on its equipment. It was often just a matter of making sure the right train was on the right track at the right time. That was the responsibility of the dispatcher, a job that's changed significantly over the years. When the RF&P started out, uh, you had towers on the line of road and the dispatcher would instruct the tower when to operate, where to operate the trains, and the tower operators would throw the switches and line the trains up where the dispatcher wanted, and when the train passed, the operator would telegraph the time the train had passed, and the train dispatcher would record everything on his train sheet, and he kept track of all of the trains, where they were at and where they had to go from the sheet of paper that sat in front of him. Uh, by the time I got into it, the towers had been closed one by one and control of the railroad had been turned over to the train dispatcher. Basically, I guess it would be like an air traffic controller for the railroad. It's extremely huge responsibility to not put equipment, men and equipment in harm's way or to run two trains together. When I went to work for the railroad, uh, the operations were conducted at the ICA Transportation Center. Our office, the train dispatcher's office, was in a relatively small room with a model board in one end of the building. We had a picture window where we could see out onto the railroad yard, but our job did not require us to look out the window. I mean, our job was in front of us at the model board. There were plenty of times that you were sweating to figure out where you were going to meet trains at and where you were going to pass trains at. It was not boring. It was anything but boring. It was a great bunch of people on the RF&P Railroad. It was sort of like a family. Certainly it was a family because children and grandchildren were regularly employed. Uh, one wag said of RFMP that it stood for relatives and friends preferred. Uh, I knew a guy who was hired because he was a good baseball player for the company team. Uh, things were so different in those years. It was true that a lot of the employees at the RFMP were sons and nephews of prior employees and even grandchildren of prior employees. People liked it and they knew each other, and it just was a good feeling. They also had a feeling of great importance because they knew they had a function and they could see it going by on the tracks. RF&P was unusual in that it was a short railroad uh, at 100 to roughly 110 miles, but it was a very busy railroad. RF&P was, was considered one of the richest little railroads in the world. It had the most direct route by railroad between the northeast and the southeast. Any traffic going north and south would most likely end up going over the RF&P, so some people called it the gold-plated railroad. The RF&P was like a funnel. In Richmond, our principal connections were Seaboard Airline Railroad and Atlantic Coastline Railroad. The RF&P would just put their locomotives on the head in. They would take it to Potomac Yard and they would give it to uh, the uh, Baltimore, Ohio, the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, to, to forward their traffic uh, to wherever it was going. So it was a pretty good deal. They were a bridge route. But the truth was, the railroad business was changing, hastened by the advent of the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System in the 1950s. Americans had more options for moving their goods and themselves around the country. And more often than not, they were no longer choosing railroads. Strangely enough, when they, when they built the interstate highway system, you ended up with the interstate highway system being right beside the railroad tracks. And the reason for that was the way towns developed, they would build them alongside the railroads or the railroads were built to connect them. When they came along with Interstate 95, they basically just built it near US-1, which was right beside the RFP. So 
trucks that use it, the cars that use it, we're all patrons of the railroad. So the, the government comes along and, and builds an interstate highway system that basically bankrupted the railroads. And so one by one, the railroads fell upon hard times. That's what led to some of the consolidation, the mergers, and, uh, but, but RFP continued to function, which satisfied everybody who was busy trying to keep the heads of our water, figuratively speaking. Passenger travel had been in steady decline nationwide. In 1970, Congress passed the Rail Passenger Service Act, establishing a national railroad to provide medium and long distance passenger service between cities. Amtrak began operating in May 1971, taking over passenger train operations from the RFNP and other private railroads. This spelled the end for Broad Street Station. RFNP's Grand Cathedral of Transportation received its final train on a cold morning in November 1975. RFNP soldiered on, but its complex ownership, combined with the struggles of the industry as a whole, left it vulnerable. At both ends of the RFNP, the remaining railroads were being consumed by mergers. Their linchpin route, linking north and south, made it a target. When seaboard system and chassis system merged, we knew that in due time, the RFMP would be gone. It gave them roughly 50% of the RFMP. So the handwriting was on the wall in the early 1980s when they merged. And it took probably close to 10 years for them to actually take over the RFMP. CSX, for its own purposes and for its own reasons, wound up having uh, two-thirds control of RFP. So it was a natural evolution. It wasn't something that happened overnight. It really belonged in a larger network. And so, but so CSX in the late 80s decided that they would try to buy all of the interest in the RFP railroad. And of course, they approached the other shareholders, the main shareholders being Norfolk Southern in the state of Virginia about buying out their interest and that was a deal that finally went through and uh, they split the company into two sections the railroad section and the real estate section and that deal closed and that was the end of the RFP since 1834. It's a miracle really that RFP lasted as long as it did as a, as a railroad. We liked what we were doing. We felt like we ran a good railroad, and, um, and we felt like we could run the railroad better than anybody else. Change, nobody likes change. So the fear of the change, how am I gonna be affected by that? Am I have a job, am I gonna have to move? What am I gonna do? What's gonna happen to the RFP? Why can't I just stay here? Why don't y'all go away? That's the mentality. There were others that said it is what it is, and I'm gonna make the best of it, and they, they did fine. R&P people, you know, they're railroaders and they take what comes. The RF&P ceased operations as a railroad in October 1991. But over the course of its 157 year history, the company had acquired significant amounts of property along its route, including a number of acres in Henrico County, land that is now home to Glen Allen Stadium at RF&P Park. Well, the philosophy at the RF&P was to make to maximize the use of its assets. And it turned to looking at real estate development as a, as a way to do that. The idea being that RFMP could attract a business that would use the RFMP railroad to service it, to bring in whatever merchandise it would be selling or manufacturing. And that was still the idea when the merger between RFMP and CSX came to fruition and the then president of the RFMP, Frank Crovo, decided that as the RFMP was going out of business, it would be a very public spirited gesture to donate the land to Henrico County for the purposes of adding it to the park. What resulted after that is, is more generosity. We had two rail cars, a coach car and a mail car donated by a private individual 
And then five years later, we had a freight car and a caboose donated by several corporations. As a historian, it was wonderful to see history still alive in an area where it was so important to the community. Um, here you have thousands of people. This, this park hosts 16,000 spectators a year uh, for tournaments and ball games. And to be able to keep that history alive in the park with these rail cars and the tabletop signage that interprets them was just, to me, a real win-win for the community and for the traveling public that comes to these tournaments every year. These cars have been places, they've seen things, they could tell stories. Although its trains no longer run through the heart of Virginia, the RFNP remains embedded in the history of the communities it touched and the imagination of the people it served. RFNP was a, a household name that was highly regarded. And they did their job well. I think they should be remembered for that. They're going to abandon and do away with and turn rails to trails on, on, on a lot of places, the RFMP won't be one of them. It's always going to be there.